Well, thank you, and good morning. Well, please be seated. Um, yes, so we were sent up to Semong Kong to grow the church, so we're doing it one way or the other. So um, baby Ruth was born 11 days ago, and uh, imagine that, being 11 days old. She's in a case just sleeping through it all. It, it really looks good. Uh, anyway, and um, here's a quick photo of uh, my family, uh, my beautiful wife, Adele, and then uh, the boy behind her, Ruben, he was wrapped to me um, the last time we were here at the team night to give some mission feedback. Uh, he's a real boy's boy. I love it. He's a petrol head. I'm not even, but I'll become one just because he is. And Rebecca, our extroverted daughter, uh, we love her very much. Um, you saw the children's center or the children's orphanage um, in the Lesotho feedback. And some days we get there and the kids, you know, they, it's almost as though they're tired and they don't know what to do and they're just sitting there. But my daughter will run in and grab them by their hands and she's like, this is the time to play, so let's play. And she pulls them in and she gets them started. And then here's a photo of little Ruth um, and she's just chilling it out. We love having her. Yeah, so Adele and I um, moved to Lesotho in 2020, and prior to that, we were employed as full-time staff at New Life Church in Mossel Bay. So uh, under Lesotho Mission, but still, even though we're under the leadership of Lesotho Mission, we are still very much connected to the staff at New Life. So sorry that Dolan has come that way. We really are. Uh, but that's God's plan and not ours. Um, and I was actually in Mossel Bay now for 10 days uh, for the paternity leave, and it allowed me to be part of the inauguration um, of Dolan. And so it, it was a great time. It really, I don't know if, if this comes as good news to you, but it feels like a, a, a God shift for Dolan and Sarah, and well, not just them as leaders, but for the congregation there. And the positive thing is that it is good for you guys as well. Now, trials and, t uh, trials and challenges are part of life, and God uses it to produce something in us. And you might find that you find yourself in a trial, but as James says, rejoice because it produces perseverance. And uh, Dolan said something that I can remember. He said, it is great to come back to Grafrenet and see you guys continuing with the work, not just hoping to maintain it, but to also grow it. And so I praise God for that. Um, we need to be kingdom-minded. We do not follow people or leaders, but we follow a leader who is Jesus. So well done. And it's already been a couple of months. Um, and so, and God has somebody for you guys to help lead. But until then, um, the elders are doing a great job. Well done. Um, you guys keep it up. Um, it is encouraging to me who's looking in from the outside. Anyway, so we moved up to Lesotho in 2020, and the goal was to see um, not just the local congregation being pastored, but also to see um, more churches planted in the nation of Lesotho. And last year, our theme was to build. And um, just to take you through a bit of the history, when we moved there in 2020, you'll see a picture here of an army tent that's being taken down, and you can see I'm quite happy. Um, we used to have services in this army tent, and it was horrendous, man. You would, you would be singing, you'd praying, and the tent would like flap, and the dust would like, you know, you'd have to close your eyes when a gust of wind comes, and then the snow falls in winter, and it tears the tent. Uh, you always packing out the equipment and putting it back in. And uh, we started speaking to people and said, hey, we need to build a building. Um, end of 2020, there was enough funds to cast the foundation. So we moved from the tent into this room. Um, and um, we, we were in this room for about two years. Um, and, and thanks to God, last year, Easter, we were able to move into our new building. And here's a photo of the new building. Yeah, praise God. <laughs> Um, I saw in the clip that the guys, and uh, Sean, I see you at the back there. Good to see you. He was carrying bricks. Those bricks are finally in the wall. <laughs> um, and so uh, we, we're very grateful for the building. It really does make a statement in the community because a tent just doesn't communicate permanence, even though it's there for three, four years. And... Um, 
but with the theme to build, we, we haven't just seen a physical structure go up, but we have seen uh, God has been faithful. People have been built in their faith. People have taken their faith seriously. And, um, and so there were other growth markers we were hoping to see with moving into the new building. And 11 months later, we're seeing what really encourages us, which we're grateful for because we need to see a sustaining work develop there. And, um, and so even though we pastor this small congregation and there is a, another church plant in the city, the idea is to see many more churches planted. And we're still working hard at finding a model that works in Lesotho, especially in the religious climate um, that, that we face. And so we know it's a spiritual battle and almost more a spiritual battle than it is a physical one that we, we're trying to, um, to win. And we're able to do what we do because there are people who have bought into the kingdom of God and who partner with us. And you guys as a church, you're a partner with us in the Sutu Mission. Um, and so there are a number of churches that partner with us, but there are also a lot of individuals that partner with us, whether it is in prayer or um, financial contribution. And there's a lot of people that give and even small amounts that allow us to continue um, uh, but we, uh, I would like to extend the invitation for you to join the team. And if you're interested in partnering with us, whether it's prayer or financially, um, I'd love to speak with you after the service. There's also a flyer at the info desk uh, if you just want to grab that. Um, so I'll be, after, uh, I'll be available after the service for that. Okay, I've um, prepared something this morning. So before we jump into that, let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for your goodness. Uh, we praise your holy name. We praise and bless your name. We thank you, Father, that uh, for, for the immense privilege of being in relationship with you. We thank you, Lord, that you love us. And, Father, that this life only has meaning and purpose when we live it with you. And we thank you that you've opened the door to us and have welcomed us into that. Father, we open our hearts to your word and that you would guide us, Holy Spirit, we desire to grow and submit to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so today's title is sanctification. Now, the, the root of the word sanctification is to sanctify. And that means to be set apart, and more specifically, to be set apart as holy. And that is what God does. He, he sanctifies us. Now, we understand what it is to set things apart, in, in your kitchen, you've got cutlery and crockery that is for special occasions and that which is for common use. And so uh, Christmas wasn't so long ago, so then you take out the special dishes, right? If I go to your cupboard, if, I, if you open it there, you've got clothes that are set apart for a wedding. You're not going to put those clothes on and start painting a wall in your house or do gardening because it's been set apart for a specific service, uh, surf, your service. If I go into your toilet, you don't use the same cloth to clean the toilet bowl and then you quickly also clean your face, right? That's gross. <laughs> There's a cloth set apart for your face. And that's what God does with us. He, he sanctifies us, he makes us holy, and he sets us apart from sin. And it, this topic has blessed me tremendously in my faith. Um, and you might hear about this for the first time today, or it might just be a reminder, but I, I hope that it blesses you and it equips you as well. And so, with sanctification, theologians have come up with language. You know, modern day people speak more about uh, what they call um, spiritual formation. So, spiritual formation, sanctification is kind of the same thing. And it's actually a word we, we get from the Bible. But theologians have helped us with stages of sanctification, uh, where it starts with positional sanctification, then it moves into progressive sanctification, and then final sanctification. And so these, these words are big words, but they're easy to understand. Um, and, and if you're taking notes, um, go ahead and jot that down. At the moment of salvation... We experience um, positional sanctification. 
where we are saved from the ultimate penalty of sin, which moves into progressive sanctification. And this is the process whereby we are saved from the practice and the power of sin. Um, this morning, I'll be focusing on the first two. And then we move over into when we finally leave this world, uh, we've, we finally get to final sanctification where we are saved from the presence of sin. The longer I live the harder life becomes. Uh, that doesn't make me hopeless, but the more you just get to see how this world works, how broken it is, how evil it is, it, it creates a great sense of despair. And sometimes when I, I think of heaven, it, it feels a bit too good to be true. But luckily, the promise is true. And um, when it says you are finally saved from the presence of sin, it really sounds like paradise. So um, some days you want to go there sooner than others. Um, so to start out, um, positional sanctification. The idea of your position before God that you are set apart. This is a one-time act. This, this happens through the power of, of not just the cross, but the Holy Spirit as well. We've got um, just as the, the language of the Bible is very helpful in this. So 2 Corinthians 5, it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So here we see that the sin I had was placed on Jesus, and the righteousness that he has has been um, imputed to me. I have received the righteousness because I'm in him. So I'm only righteous because I'm in him. And, and so this position of where you once were sinful, but you are now righteous is made clear here. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 11 actually uses the word sanctified. And it says, and that, and that is what some of you were, referring to the life they used to live. You can read that in the preceding verses. But you were washed and you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It says that you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus. You were washed. Your position before God has changed. And it says um, you are justified. I love that word. It's only God who is just to forgive sin. It is a judge who is ju just to, ju to make a judgment. Um, he is just to pardon your, a judge is just to pardon you when you have either paid your penalty or you are forgiven. And so in, in, in um, John, I believe it's in the letters of John, it says if, um, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. He is just, he's the one who can actually pardon your sin. And so uh, we, we find ourselves with, with God, the only God, the only powerful one who has cleaned the slate, who has wiped away, who has washed you clean. And, and so this is the position that has changed. I love the other language where it speaks about how we have, uh, we, were, we were dead in our transgressions and we have been made alive in Christ Jesus. So the position from death to life. We were in darkness and in sin and now we are in the kingdom of light. We are in the kingdom of His Son whom He loves. And so the, the position has changed. 2 Corinthians 5.17. If you're an old school kid church, well then you called it Sunday school kids, you know 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, whoever is in Christ uh, is a new creation, right? You are a new creation. The position has changed. The old is gone. The new has come. Positionally before God, when you come to salvation, when you come to that point where you truly believe and that belief leads you to repentance, where you do not just continue the same lifestyle and entertaining the same um, habits of sin, uh, and, and, and you, you have this revelation where you say, I need to correct my life and worship God with my life, live my life for Him. You enter into that positional sanctific uh, sanctification. You're positionally changed. And then this automatically leads to progressive sanctification. So those who are born again naturally start acting in accordance with their new nature. 
And the result, the result leads to, to holiness and per, a personal life that pleases God and the Holy Spirit can continue the work of regeneration in you. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts us of sin. It's, it's interesting that we as people need to be taught what sin is and righteousness, and that we need the Holy Spirit to point out in us what is sin. For us to go, oh, that, that's not good, you know, it helps us understand how fallen our state is in sin. But sometimes our image of the Holy Spirit is that he, he is one that goes through the, disapprovingly through the rooms of our hearts, looking at the mess that lies around. And he says, well, you better sort that out. That is not in order. That is not how it should be. And even though there's some truth maybe in that, I think it's, much, it's a, a, a much healthier way to view the Holy Spirit of, as, as, as the person who convicts us of our new nature in Christ. That when we do behave like our old nature, he rather goes, have you not been made righteous in Christ Jesus? Has he not given you a spirit of purity? Has he not given you self-control? And then for us as the believer to go, that is true. My new nature is one of self-control, of gentleness, of kindness, and to step in alignment with this new nature. Um, I was going to speak about, uh, for the media lady, um, if we can actually jump to those herd boys in the Sutu. I want to use that example a bit earlier today. This is a typical image of the herds boys in Lesotho, and um, the, due to HIV having a drastic impact in the nation of Lesotho, um, there are, a lot of the shepherds are actually um, orphans. They don't have family anymore, and so the easiest sort of way to make a living is to become a shepherd. So they hire shepherds, but in many of the shepherds, they are either just um, the flock belongs to them, or they are. Um, you know, the, the sons in the, in the family would then take care of the flock. But they're easy to recognize with their gum boots and their stick and a dog often following them with the blanket, which serves for the icy wind, for um, the hot sun and cold winters. Sometimes it even protects them from the rain. And th these guys are generally a bit of the, the unrefined people. I don't want to sound too derogatory, but they can be quite unrefined in their lifestyle. Uh, they, they love, you know, you could actually make a documentary about these guys because they live a really hard life. And as you have to let land rest and the animals have to graze elsewhere, they move between cattle posts um, through, throughout the year. And in this photo, you'll see they, they live in these kind of huts when they, if we can have the next photo, um, and these little huts, they, they kind of, they temporary housing. Sometimes what even happens is lightning will strike these huts and it, it will just kill everybody inside. It, it's really, uh, as, as foreigners, sometimes when we look at lightning, we stand there in awe. In Lesotho, it's more of a thing that it, it's probably killed somebody in their family or close to them, and it's a horrific thing. But they live in these little huts, and they eat and sleep and do everything in here. Here's a photo of the inside um, of one of the shepherds. And I must say, they're interesting people. Um, as you can see, his hands aren't very clean. When they go from cattle post to cattle post, they don't even take a bag of clothes, right? Maybe one change of clothes. You won't see toothpaste and toothbrush on his donkey, right? He just wants some maize meal, and he wants to get on with it. He wants to do his job. And I want you to imagine, because um, in the, in the, Lesotho is called a kingdom because it still has a king, uh, it still has a royal house. Just imagine that the king's son gets lost, and as many orphans become um, shepherds, this child that has been lost in whatever way sees himself as an orphan, he has to find a way to, uh, to, to make a living, he becomes a shepherd, and he starts living this life where you, you know, you don't brush your teeth, you, you swear, you smoke a lot of dacha because that's just what you do, you, um, you're very unrefined. And for whatever reason, there's suddenly a connection made between this lost son and the palace, and they obviously automatically bring him back, and he has to start living in the palace. This shepherd boy will have to really adjust his lifestyle. You'll agree, right? No burping and farting at the table 
Well, they don't even sit at the table. You suddenly have to eat with silverware where you love eating with your hands. And why I'm talking about this is just to give you a picture of our old nature versus our new nature. uh, Colossians, we'll look at it in a moment. Um, Well, let's actually just look at 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. It is written, be holy because I am holy. And so uh, we understand our, our, our position in Christ is one of holiness. But sometimes when we reflect on our everyday life, we go like, oh, you know, this is a mess. Um, today I didn't look very much like Jesus when I had that conversation or had this outburst or the thoughts that I was entertaining or the things that were going on in my heart. And so the progressive sanctification is that process of giving over to the new nature. Colossians 3.10 and and have put on the new self. So we see this, uh, this, this active decision of putting on the new self. I love the language of Colossians chapter 3. It says, set your mind on the things above. Set your heart on the things. Take off the old self. Clothe yourself with the new self. Uh, Take off the old self. Did I say that correctly? Yeah. Put on the new self. And so we see that progressive sanctification is the process where we, um, where, where the, the power of sin becomes weaker and weaker in our lives. But it requires an active giving over. You and I actively have to give over. So this process of sanctification is very much passive but active as well. And so the passive side is that God has done the positional sanctification. The new position is there. Now come in alignment with that. And so with the shepherd boys, you know, the example of how he would move into the, into the palace, he has to learn to behave becomingly of the life in the palace. And the same for you and I. We have to overcome the challenge of the old self and move into be, becoming the new nature. And this, the Holy Spirit, of course, helps us with. And when we talk about sanctification in this sense, it becomes our confession and our defense. Uh, because sin has a nasty way of attaching itself to us or making us feel guilty. And actually, it, it, it slows us down in the race of faith. And, and so I, I, I love speaking about this topic because it empowers us to overcome those shortfalls and those uh, sort of personal weaknesses that we all have in our journey with God. Um, Romans 6 Oh, sorry, can I have the previous one? Okay, no, sorry. Can we have Romans 6? Thank you. Thank God you once were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you've become slaves to righteous living. It says there, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And then it says, you're slaves to righteous living. You're like, what does that mean? Anyway, a slave is obedient to his master. And so that's what the language is creating. We once were obedient to sin. But praise God, and through the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, he has set you free from the power of sin. And now we have the choice to be obedient to righteousness. Um, Romans 12. And and this is part of, you'll see, I've underlined the last line. And this is where the confession really comes in. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And this, you know, a living sacrifice. What is a a living sacrifice? Well, a sacrifice, we understand, is an animal that is sacrificed on an altar. And so how can you be a living sacrifice? Well, you do it every day. And so every day I die to self. Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross, 
Today, the, the cross is an image of love, but back in the day, the cross was an image of suffering. So he says, take up the suffer, suffering of denying oneself and follow me. And it, it requires a lot. The gospel might be free, but it requires your whole life. And there's nothing more rewarding than giving your life for God. And, and, and when we place our, our lives in the hands of God, He can do significantly more with our life than what you and I could possibly try with our own effort. It gives us purpose. It gives us meaning. It gives us hope. And so even though we live this life of, of trials and suffering and denying oneself, it is the greatest love, life of peace and fulfillment and hope. It is, it's such a great paradox anyway. So to be a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. And then it says, this is your true and proper worship. Yes, we worship God through song. And we can worship God through, through acts of goodness. When we do good towards others, it's worship to God. But we have to understand also when we deny ourselves and choose righteousness, that it is received as worship before God. And then it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we need to renew our thinking. Our thinking needs to change. And there's been times in my life where there's um, just either it is habitual um, weakness, you know, I find myself really struggling with impatience, or whether it's just like sometimes it feels as though the devil is just dumping like thoughts in your head that you weren't even meditating on, but they suddenly like on you. And God showed me this in that time, and it was a friend that I spoke to, because it's always important when we're struggling with something to bring it in the open. Um, sin in its secrecy has its power, where you think, I'm going to overcome this by myself. You know, then the pride says, oh, just, just don't tell anybody, you know. And then you try overcome it yourself, and when you look again, you've just stumbled in that same way. So I was speaking to a friend just with some things that w were really challenging me, and, he's, and he's, he, he just took me through some of these passages, and I had to find ways to confess the new nature. And where I found myself incredibly impatient, I would have to reflect on what the New Testament had to say. Thank you, God, that you've given me a new nature. Thank you that right now I can put on the new self, and I can choose to forgive. Even though my heart doesn't want to forgive and I don't want to forgive, I choose the new nature and I put on the new nature and I'll confess that I forgive them, you know. Even though I feel like I, I am justified in being offended. Um, even though I feel as though um, they should be the first one to apologize. I go, thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for me without me first saying sorry. You loved me. You showed me forgiveness before I even sought it. And so therefore, I can love and forgive others. Whether it is impure thoughts or, or lust, thank him that he's given you a new spirit of purity, that he, has, that, he, that he has placed righteousness in you and that you are not a slave to sin, but you're a, you can be obedient to righteousness. And so we, we need these confessions because just crying out, say, God, take it away. I'm so sorry, you know, and guilt settles in and all of that. There's maybe some fruit in it, but I was doing that, and it wasn't very fruitful. But when I, and look, you need to habitually do this. It's, it's, a, it's a practice, and I'll tell you, if you don't have kids, kids will test you. They will. You, you will be the grown-ass adult, and you feel like acting like a kid because they bring something out in you. And you, you're going to have to stop and remind yourself, thank you, God, that, I'm, that I have a new nature. Thank you that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is self-control, that it's gentleness, it's patience. And as you practice it, you will see the power of sin just become weak in your life. And that's part of progressive sanctification, where we can see the, the power and the practice of sin reduce in our everyday life. I hope that was helpful to you. Um, I would like to just close in prayer um, as we just commit this to God. Father, we love you. And we are so encouraged by who you are and what you do in our lives. And Father, I pray for us. And maybe if you're sitting here and something has come to mind, won't you just bring that topic to him? And Father, thank you that even though we struggle and we are weak, 
and you encourage us towards the perfection of Jesus Christ. You know that we are human, that we are weak, that we are easily, we are easily tempted. And Lord, thank you that you, have, you do not tempt us beyond what we can endure and that you always give us a way out. And so as we sit here, we commit our lives to you, Lord, and help us as believers to spend time in the Word so that we can be equipped with positive confessions because we know that our defense is in you, Christ Jesus. You have set us apart. You have sanctified us. You have washed us clean. You have forgiven us. And Lord, as we continue with progressive sanctification, we, we, we stand on those truths and we need to confess them. Holy Spirit, that you would lead and guide us to passages of Scripture to overcome it. God, we do not want to be sin-focused, but we want to be righteousness-focused. Thank you for the abundant life that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.